into expertise. Don't be, don't always be on a level. Grow your value. When you grow your value, you are talking about effectiveness. You are talking about uh, you being in a place where it will be, it will be difficult to replace. A lot of Christians, when they are in that work, in, in that place of work, we discover that, you know, the kind of value they have is not enough. For they are not indispensable. No man is indispensable, but there are men that are that are difficult to replace. Be that man, be that woman, and the only way you can beat be that person is to grow your value. Another thing you need to grow is grow your volume. Now, when we talk about growing your volume, we are talking about capacity. Grow your capacity. Grow your capacity. Grow your content. Because when you look at a, um, different containers with different volume, right, they can contain different things, different sizes of things. So you don't want to retain your capacity. Grow your capacity. Extend. Extend. And this is something that Christ himself talked about. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He said you will start from Jerusalem. You go to Judea and then Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So you see that as the church journeyed through those geographies, there, were, there was need for capacity extension. There was a need for, for the church to grow its volume. So also you, for your personal life, for your family, for your ministry, grow your volume. Another thing is grow your vision. We are talking about expansion. See beyond yourself. See beyond you know, your immediate um, vicinity. Look far. Have a vision because we know that men are likely to follow a man with a vision. Because the Bible says that when there is no vision, people perish. So if you are leading your family, if you are leading a church, if you are leading a team in your place of work, do you have a vision that the people will see and know that this man is a man of vision? Grow your vision. Grow your vision. Grow your vision. Another thing you need to do is grow your voice. Now, when we talk about voice, we are talking about influence. And this influence is an influence that comes by impact. It's not an influence that comes because, you know, you know that some people, they are married, they are husbands, and they feel because, you know, I'm a husband, then all the world should crumble at my feet. No. What impact do you bring into your family that makes you a voice? What impact do you bring? Impact fuels influence. So when we talk about growing your voice, we're talking about growing in things that will increase your impact to your community and thereby increasing your influence. Now, when you do these things, and when you set goals with these things in mind, you will discover that the best version of you is yet to be seen. And when that version comes, the church will be blessed, the family will, will be blessed, and the whole world will be blessed in Jesus' name. Point number three, before we pray. The strategy of God for superlative glory. The strategy of God for superlative glory. Now, when you look at, um, there's a strategy that God has. In our text, Luke chapter 14, verse 27. It says, and whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's what the Bible says. And in verse 33, it says, So likewise, whosoever it be of you that forsakes not all that he has cannot be my disciple. So when we talk about what is the strategy of God to attract glory to us, it is simple. You have the cross, you have the cup, you have the comforter, you have the crown. So we are in a generation where a lot of people are pursuing the crown. They are pursuing the crown. They want to be up there, but they don't know that there is a cross. There is a cup. The cross and the cup is the price we pay for the crown. The comforter is the partner that God gives us on our journey to the crown. And the crown is the prize we possess. Is the prize we possess. So when we talk about God's strategy for superlative glory, we need to do a quick um, definition of what glory really means. Because it is very glorious when you set a goal and you achieve it. But what does glory mean? And I put it this way in simple terms. It is glory and glorious when God is glorified. 
So as you pursue that goal, let your motivation be the glorification of God. Because whatever thing you do, whatever thing you achieve on earth, and you do not glorify God by it, it's not glorious. It's not glorious. But when God is glorified, when you seek the glory of God, as you launch out, as you break beyond limits, as you break beyond barriers to achieve the destiny that God has given unto you, you will discover that the glory of God will also rub off on you. Because the Bible says when you behold that glory, you yourself, you are changed into the image of that glory. And we should know that we have all it takes, even though there is the cross, there is the cup. But we have the comforter, we have the Holy Spirit that can give us everything we need as we pursue the dreams of the church, the visions of the church, as we launch out into the deep to get people into the kingdom, as we go into our profession and, and decide to do great things for God. We know by every assurance that the Holy Spirit is with us, the comforter is with us. And as long as he's with us, we will take the crown. It is good, like what the apostle when he wanted to leave this earth, he said, there is laid down for me a crown of righteousness. And I'm telling you, this reward, this glorious reward, it's not just when we get to heaven. It is both here on earth. We will get the reward here on earth, and we get it in heaven in Jesus' name. Let us rise to our feet as we go to the Lord in prayer. I want to believe that the Lord has spoken to you, the Lord has spoken to me. Goals, growth, and glory. The prayer point is simple. If you have been a mediocre up to this point, if you have been someone that, you know, visionless or up to this point, you are just, life is the one moving you. You are not the one moving life. You want to pray and say, Lord, no more. Lord, no more. Lord, no more. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to count the cost. I'm going to pursue the vision that God has given me. I'm going to pursue the dream. I'm going to possess the gates of the enemy. Oh, I will fulfill my own quota to the expansion of the kingdom of God. I will fulfill my quota so that people will know that I am a Christian. The spirit of the living God dwells in me, the excellent spirit. Everything I do, I touch, comes successful and prosperous because that is the promise of God for you. Because that is the promise of God for you. Because that is the promise of God for us as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We worship you for this um, session. We thank you for the visitation of your word and how your word has challenged us, rebuked us, corrected us, charged us. Lord, we thank you because we know that we are not the same. But Lord, we have one thing to ask of you, that the mediocre spirit, the spirit of average, the mentality of a nobody, that the enemy is pushing on us. Lord, take it out from us in the name of Jesus. And let the spirit of excellence that we have of the Holy Ghost, let it come into our vessels in the name of Jesus. And everywhere we do anything we touch, Lord, let it be prosperous in Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask that as we continue with the service today, Holy Ghost continually visit us, continually bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Name he's here in our midst. Amen. How many of us believe that? I believe that with all of my heart. There's no technicality to it. And we believe that the presence of God is here in our midst. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the Lord indwells the praises of his people. He inhabits it. And even as we lift up the name of Jesus, the name above every other name, he will draw all men unto him in Jesus' name.
Lord, I thank you. Lord, I worship you. Lord, there's no one like you. Only the living can praise God. Only people that have breath coming in and out of them can praise God. That he leaves his throne in heaven and he comes down on earth to receive the praises of his people. I could have been dead today. And all he has done for me, my very soul shall shout hallelujah. Praise God for say. I don't know about you, but when I think of his goodness, when I think
I just got the doctor's note this past week, and it seems like all bad and gloom. This is the song that God laid on our hearts for you. Even though you may not understand it. Here's why, here's why. You're not a man, no. You're not a man, no. You are the God who opens doors. No man can shut. Let all men be liars and only God be true. You're not
the psalmist says, uh, my soul will give praise unto God. Because praise and worship can only come not from your flesh, but from your soul. Let's lift up the name of Jesus this morning. time we want the heavens to open to us someone this morning more than this we want to worship the lord the more let's give him the praise how great the lord has been to us keep worshiping him this morning let's worship him let's give him the praise let's give him all adoration how great he has been the lord is great and we are here to worship him in the beauty of his holiness how great he is he has been to you Let's worship him, let's praise him, let's give him the glory because he has been marvelous in his dealings with us. Give him the praise this morning. If we have the whole of eternity, it won't be enough to give him the praise. To worship him, brethren, let's open our mouths, let's worship him this morning, let's give him the praise this morning because he is great, how great thou art. Then sings our soul unto him this morning. How great thou art, then sings our soul. We'll keep on singing, we'll keep on singing as we keep on worshiping him. And he will accept our thanksgiving this morning in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we worship.
chapter 26. I read from verses 1 and 2. I will jump to 17 to 19. Then I will jump to 26 to 29. Matthew 26 verse 1 says, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now, the first day, that's verse 17, of the Feast of Unliving Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where will thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master said, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Verse 29, but I say unto you, I will not drink and forth of these fruits of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. First Corinthians chapter 11, I read from verse 23 to 30. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed to bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the lost dead till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now we have read the scriptures to give us the background of what we are doing at this moment all over the region. We are talking about the Lost Supper. We need to remind ourselves that this is one of the two ordinances that the Lord commanded us to do before he left. The other is water baptism. God's word teaches that the Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus Christ so that all believers all over the world, all members of the family of God, might partake thereof regularly. Why? To show the lost dead till he comes. The gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, Luke, they talk about it. In First Corinthians that we read, Paul amplified it in this First Corinthians 11. Actually, Luke made a connection between the Feast of Passover and the Lord's Supper. Our Lord Jesus Christ instructed us to do it. Before we continue, we have some questions that we need to ask ourselves, and we need to answer the questions before we continue. We want to ask what's the purpose, the purpose of what we are doing this morning, is there any preparation that we need to do before we do it? Are there patterns that we need to follow? Are there protocols that we need to follow? Is there any prerequisite 
for you and I to follow before we do it? What are the perils, the danger of taking the Lord's Supper if we don't follow the protocol? Who are the participants? Who are supposed to participate? And what is the profit if we do it the way the Lord commanded us to do it? The profit, we can see it in the first Corinthians that we read. It is a command. And when we obey the Lord, we make the Lord to be happy. It's a command. We are told, do this in remembrance of me. Apart from being a command, it's a constant reminder of great sacrifice Jesus paid for you and I to redeem us from our sin. Each time we observe it, we are reminding ourselves of the great sacrifice that Jesus paid to buy us back. We know the way we are before we came to Christ. We know the level of sin we have been into, but a day came in our life we answered yes to Jesus, and Jesus saved us. Not only that, it's a call for self-examination. You examine yourself, I examine myself, whether I'm still in the race or whether I'm off the track. My prayer for every one of us this morning that we will be in the race to the end in Jesus' name. Apart from all this, it is a time, it's a place of intimacy with the Lord. If you partake in it, you are telling yourself that by God's grace, I and my Lord, we are one. We are one entity. It is also to commemorate and celebrate our redemption. We are told in Matthew 26, verse 17, now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciple came to Jesus saying unto him, where will thou that we prepare to eat the Passover. Also, is to anticipate our reunion. We know that this world is not our own. A time is come when everybody we will meet the Lord, and the Lord is coming back. He said, He told us that I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Our hope is to see Christ at the end of our life. And by God's grace, if we tarry, if we are not discouraged, we will see him to the end in Jesus' name. Now who are to participate? Is it just anybody can just come and grab the Lord's Supper and, and take it? Who are the participants? We are told in Exodus, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, I read from verse 43. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of Passover. Take note, there shall no stranger eat thereof. No stranger. Stranger, sinners, they have no right to take part. He said, But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. No foreigner. A higher servant shall not eat thereof. When you look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 48, it tells us that, and when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and we keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his maids be circumcised. Participants need to be circumcised, set apart for the Lord. He said, and then let him Come near and keep it, and he shall be as one of the that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So before you take it, you need to examine yourself whether you are still in the race. The prerequisite is salvation. Is your salvation still current? Current salvation, not yesteryear's salvation. Those are the people that are supposed to take it. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Then how do we prepare for it? Preparation. Preparation is need, we need to make personal preparation. You examine yourself. We need to make corporate preparation. Now, before we come to this place, our leaders have set apart 
the elements of the Lord's Supper. Brethren, as we look forward to the rapture and coming of the Lord, we must remain righteous, we must remain pure, because to miss the Lord's table on grounds of being unprepared could amount to missing heaven. I pray we will not miss heaven in Jesus' name. Should the Lord come at this moment, maybe you are telling yourself, it is not time to take the Lord's Supper, I'm not going to take it. Which means if Christ should come right now, you are not ready. But by the grace of God, you will be ready in Jesus' name. God is a God of second chance, but I employ every one of us not to wait for second chance because the Lord can come any moment. Apart from that, life is not guaranteed anybody. Then, what are the peril, the danger? If you take it the way you are not supposed to take it, we find the danger in that First Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 29. Brethren, in the Bible-believing church, I ask a lot of grave consequences that can befall people that take this unworthily. Weakness can come, sickness can come, death can even come. That is why we are told in verse, that verse 29, it says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not designing the Lord's body. For this cause, many are sick, many are weak, many are sickly among you, and many do sleep, many die. But if you know you are right, you are able to take it, there is a profit for you and I. We have a profit here on earth and profit in heaven. We'll be able to see the Lord. He's going to renew your strength, spiritual strength, brings healing and health. For those that have faith in it, spiritual awakening to the coming of the Lord, it also gives we believers a gateway to the presence of God. Is it not wonderful how we gather together this morning and say the presence of God? The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I'm reading finally before we distribute the element. The Bible says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want all our leaders to distribute the element. Let everybody have it. And those of us that are online, Let's give to our brethren. Please let me know if everybody have taken... As you take the element, I want you to be in this solemn moment. Commit yourself to the hand of the Lord. Ask the Lord to touch you in whatever way you want the Lord to touch you. Please, I want the ushers to let me know if everybody have taken Okay. Let's open it. I need one here, please. Let's partake of the bread and remember that Jesus Christ gave his life for our salvation.
Are we done? Let's take out the bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, let's take the bread. Take it. Let's all This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's open the wine. After the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the lost death till ye come. Let's all take the wine. As you are taking the wine, I want you to pray. That's why I, I take this wine representing the blood of Christ. The Bible says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Pray that death will pass over you. Calamities will pass over you. Poverty will pass over you. Pray that you will walk with the Lord to the end. Ask the Lord, whatever you want at this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Our righteous Father, we want to thank you once again. We have obeyed what you taught us to do. The reward of obedience, I pray you will grant unto us in Jesus' name. As we have taken this element of the Lord's Supper, we are asking, O oh Lord, that you will heal our bodies, souls, and spirits in Jesus' name. You say, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. We pray, O oh Lord, that the blood of Jesus will defend us, will defend our family, our children in Jesus' name. We will not eat and drink to our own damnation in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name. We pray. Let's partake of the bread and remember that Jesus Christ gave his life for our salvation. Let's partake.